J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today on my show, I have the pleasure of chatting to Bob Weatherly from Florida in the USA to talk about his book, Windows of Wonder, Eight Timeless Tales for Today and Tomorrow. The book consists of eight short stories for kids with their reading ability. What well, I think is probably about nine to 12. Uh, Bob might differ, but when I've read the book, that's what I feel. And each story is, the, is an imaginary view into a different setting, all written in what Bob sell, says as a classical style story tradition. The stories evolve around fairy tales, ancient folklore, mythology, cleverly built upon knights of the realm, damsels, monsters, alchemists, witches, horses, and cats, all for good measure. Bob Weatherly is a lifelong spiritual seeker and avid mediator for almost four decades. He went to Maharishi International University. He obtained a bachelor's degree in history from Longwood University, and as a former teacher and park ranger, jobs that he thoroughly enjoyed, he's now writing children's books uh, for us all to enjoy and read. And Bob has always enjoyed creating and telling stories. He's a really clever storyteller, everybody. So let's invite him onto the show to find out the backdrop, the gossip, the scandal, and all that behind the the adventures of these short little stories in this book, Windows of Wonder. Bob, welcome to Talking Books. Well, thank you, John. And I just want to say hello to everybody. Good to see you. Good. Bob, you say that your book is very different and that you're a strong proponent of human potential, especially for kids, and that the so-called glue behind all of these stories is a message, a message to nine, 12 year olds, 13 year olds, um, simply to say you can achieve things with a positive mindset. But you chose to convey this message through uh, fairy tales, folklore, adventures. So, and so I'm just beginning to wonder, as for you, I think this was easier for you to converse with kids by doing, you know, telling, you know, writing these stories, these mythological stories to get your message across, but to get kids to enjoy reading good stories. Am I right? Oh, I think you're definitely uh, right about that, John. I, uh, of course, wanted anyone who reads the book, not just kids, but uh it can be anyone, basically. Um, I just want them to thoroughly enjoy the book because I think the positive messages that come through in the book, um, they're just going to take hold as you enjoy the book and read them. And there's just going to be a lot of positivity when you do read these stories because they just flow with them. So you'll just, you'll enjoy them, but they'll have the effect that I want them to have, and that is to instill a lot of positivity in your thinking and to get you to start to believe in yourself. Okay, I, I see where you're coming from there. Let's go through the stories uh, without giving too much of the storyline away. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the book, everybody, each story is headed up as, as a window. So you go, we go from window one to window eight, and then is a, a title to that um, little short story. So window one, the magic broom. How did that story come about? And of course, it was the young boy that had the magic. It wasn't the broom, was it? It was the boy who had the magic. So how did you build this story? You know, how did it come about? Do you want to tell the listeners? Sure. Um, what actually happened was I uh, used to sweep my uh, parents' pool, which had a large cement uh, area surrounding it. 
And uh, unfortunately, they had a lot of leaves because of the fact that they were, you know, in the middle of a forest practically. So I, I used to always kind of think, oh, I'm just really tired of sweeping, you know, this stuff. I just wish I had a an instrument that would allow me to just do it in just a few seconds and be done with it. And so I got to thinking about it and then I thought, wow, you know, that kind of would be an interesting little story that I might want to create. And so uh, that was the first story that I wrote in uh, writing the whole book, in fact. Uh, I hadn't intended on writing any other stories, but I just went ahead and I composed that one. And I just sort of took it from there and used uh, my own sort of experience and uh, just let it sort of go from there. Wow. Uh, because it's magical now how he goes from, you know, just the simple background to ending up, you know, in the King's Palace. But I'm not going to give it away, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and now your, your second uh, window story, The Forest People. Why did you choose to write this, you know, through the characters of Jim and Jem? You know, the town folk living a mundane life and the forest community. This little story has intrigued me. Yeah, it, it is a very, uh, very fascinating little story. Um, you basically have, I guess, what you would consider just an everyday little boy. And he just notices these very strange people that come into town one day. They're just sort of shopping and they don't usually come into town. And so he just decides to sort of follow them. And anyway, it just ends up that he develops this friendship with this little girl. And she's part of the community of these, what we call the forest people. And um, they're just very, very different from the people that he's used to being around in the community that he lives in. And he just, He's just so excited about everything that he sees and learns. And so he wants to take that back home and tell everybody about it. And that's what he does. That excitement and, comes across in the uh, book, everybody. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it is. It's very exciting. And um, it's interesting. Uh, I sort of pulled the forest people from when I was at uh, Maharishi International University, we used to have these things called forest academies. And we would take a month, three times during the year, where we would just go in and we would do nothing but meditate. And so therefore, uh, it just sort of like was seclusion. We couldn't actually go into the forest, but we sort of, you know, just uh, created that, I guess, in our own minds. And so, I just thought, well, that would be a, an ideal sort of story to make that type of community that was on a permanent basis and see the interaction between the real world and that world. So that's sort of where that came about. They're two different worlds, aren't they? Two very different worlds. Hmm. But my intention is that there is room for both in the other's world. And I think that's uh, the message here, that these two worlds can come together and benefit each other tremendously. So that's where I'm headed with that one. There you go, everyone. Um, now for me, um, this is my favorite of the short stories and it's the third window story. Um, you know, sitting brave. And it's all about the Native American boy who they call Running Bird and how he was different to the other children in the tribe, which led him to lead a, a separate life in a way. Can you, you know, give us a, a brief insight um, to the background of this story? What's the message here? Because this child is very different and even when he grows up, you know, he's slightly different, isn't he? Where did you get this story from? Um, and was it based on a particular tribe of the um, American native people? 
Well, I'm not going to say that it was based on any particular tribe, but uh, a lot of your, uh, especially in your Western Indians, um, you find a lot of mysticism and they have a, a heavy influence of the shaman who is what we might think of as the medicine man of the tribe, who basically is responsible for the healing of the tribe. And they are very, very important, very exalted in the tribe. Uh, many times often more revered than the chief himself. And so um, this, this particular young brave, he was always very fascinated with these type of uh, people. And he himself was a great athlete, but he unfortunately, apparently his body just couldn't keep up the rigors of the athleticism that was demanded by the tribe. So he sort of had to go in a different direction. And then he went ahead and he sort of, sort of followed the path, I guess you would say, of the shamans. And that's where his life turns. And then eventually uh, he does run into some problems because it does open up a very powerful realm of existence for him and it wasn't one maybe that he was quite ready to handle but he does keep working through it it takes a while but in the end he'll he'll discover that it was it was well worth it for him ah so that's where that little story came from but see i have long um even you know when i was a child I used to sit and watch the Cowboys and Indian uh, films and I with John Wayne and I used to love them. And of course, the Indians were always painted as the baddies and the Cowboys were always painted as the goodies. Um, so, and I'm fascinated by um, the American native people. And that's why this little story resonated with me. And I thought, yes, I like this little story of sitting brave in a running bird. He was, um, and of course, I do. I've read lots of books, and so I do understand the shamans, um, the spiritualists, and they were very often seen as the medical people as well, weren't they? In the uh, society, oh, yeah, they, lived in. they were the medics, they were the spiritualists, well, and very often and the leaders, also, would, the storytellers. oh, absolutely, and very often the leaders wouldn't go without you know, do things without um, conferring with the shaman. You know, is it good to go? Are the odds all right? I'm right, aren't I? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I, I think they were just fantastic storytellers. Absolutely. So they, um, the next little window story, Daughters of the Moon, the fourth window of Wonder Story. Now, this is definitely mythology for me and fairy tale telling at its best. With a touch of matchmaking, I would say here. Uh, thrown in for good measure. I take it this was a sort of storyline. Is this you through and through, you know, with witches and so forth? Is it, this is where you're coming from on this little story? I have always loved witches, just, just been endeared to them, I guess. Uh, Halloween, I was born on October the 28th, so I was almost a Halloween baby, in fact. So it's always been my favorite holiday. And I guess uh, I find witches just to be, you know, so magical. And it's like they're the most interesting of people because most people, you know, they sort of say, wow, it's like, how can these women do all of this? And men too. And, you know, it's just, it's just very exciting to allow yourself to believe that magic exists. And I think one of the things that I do in my stories is I, is I try to instill the sense that, you know, there is magic, but there's also real magic. And we can learn that from these witches and people like that. So that's sort of where that comes from. Of course, in America, the fall is a, it's a big event, isn't it? Oh, yes. Halloween's always been Halloween very popular big. here. Absolutely. <laughs> I've been there and it's, it's absolutely wonderful to go. You know, when you go to America, everybody, it's, it's the fall time. You've got Halloween. The whole place just comes alive. 
it's absolutely stunning. So I thought, oh, I wonder where he got that story from. There you go. Now we all know. Now, the next little um, window of wonder story, number five, is the mystic night. And this is probably one of the longest stories, everybody, in the book. And when I read it, I imme it immediately reminded me of King Arthur and the Round Table, um, Sir Lancelot, Camelot. So there's a similar vein here to Howard Pyle's stories of King Arthur and his knights. Tales of bravery, romance, battle, and knighthood relating back to the 12th century in, in, in Britain. Did you love reading that, you know, um, Harrod uh, Pyle's, you know, King Arthur? And does this book sort of resonate from there, you know, root from there? Is, is that where this book comes from? This little story comes from, you know, the 12th century knighthoods? Well, I think it does to a large degree, John. Um, I, I would tell you, it. though, that my favorite character... <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <cycles>. Yay. <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. I would say that my favorite character of all was always Marilyn. Marilyn the Magician. Oh, the Magician. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. And so that's what I tried to sort of emphasize in the story. In fact, I do have a wizard in there. You do. And also, uh, there is a, a very unusual part of the story, which involves a monastery. And this is a very different type of monastery than most monasteries. It's very isolated and remote. And he is sent there on a mission uh, mm. uh, all about this monastery. And he discovers these monks are very, very unusual very different than the ones he's used to dealing with. So uh, they are sort of more like in the vein of Marilyn, I would say. And uh, that sort of grabs you very differently because you don't think about, uh, you know, your average everyday monks being like someone like Marilyn, but uh, that's exactly what they are. So he finds a, a whole new world opening up to him when he goes to this monastery. He does, doesn't he? And it's intriguing, yes. And the monks aren't quite what they seem to be, everybody. And I'm saying nothing more. If you want to find out more, do you know what? Go and buy the book and read it. Now, I think this is the next little uh, window to wonder story. Cosmic Cat's Tale. And I think the character Cal is you. And this is you telling everybody about a cat story from when you were a boy. I'm right, aren't I? Oh, yes. I'm just the consummate cat lover. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had so many black cats, it's beyond belief. So oh. that's your great Halloween cat. <laughs> Tell us the story then behind this one, you know, the plot. Well, uh, it's almost like true to life. In fact, uh, one day this kitten just sort of comes out of nowhere and appears in this boy's life. And he is very taken by the kitten and, of course, adopts him. And he and the kitten become very, very close. He does have other pets that he loves, but this kitten just seems a little bit different and they develop a, a very strong bond. And, and uh, the kitten and he are basically inseparable. And what he finds is that uh, the kitten is very drawn to, uh, to him in particular because of the fact that he meditates and it seems to draw the kitten to him. And, the kitten and he almost sort of have a psychic relationship where they can like communicate with each other. And so that's where I guess I'm sort of drawing from the fact that I've always been told that cats are very psychic. Uh, we've all heard about animals and how they know when earthquakes are coming and things like that. But I have had cats that 
I have noticed they have seen things and I don't know what they're reacting to because I don't see these things, but they can almost go crazy sometimes. So I just started uh, thinking, well, what is it that they're seeing? So I thought, all right, let's write a little story about it and we'll, we'll see where it goes. So um, he and the cat just uh, have this real great adventure on a Halloween night, in fact. And uh, in fact, the cat sort of becomes separated from him and that's where the fun starts. So we'll just sort of leave it there and we'll just say this is a, a very cosmic cat indeed. You want to find out anybody, everybody? Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> now, this takes a turn here because for me, the last two um, Windows of Wonder stories are different to the others. Um, Mentalion, the seventh window story for me, this is a totally different story from the previous stories. You have the characters Chance and Bida, the man of the ocean, that's who he is. Uh, Mantalion is the technology of the mind and allows our thinking to transcend the borders of the known. That's what you say. So Mantalion takes, it's, takes us beyond limitations which we would otherwise be constrained by. And for me, you've deviated from the norm here in your normal pattern of storytelling. Why did you put this story in the book? What's the message to the kids here? Um, is this uh, you venturing into the realm of more futuristic um, books, realms, writings? Tell me. Well, I don't know that I want to say that. I would say the future is now, in fact. I would tell you that... What I firmly believe, and I think a lot of people do in fact, is that most scientists will tell you we only use about 5% of our brain capacity. And I would uh, tell you that there is simply no reason that we can't expand that and use more of that brain. Thousands of years of evolution will, in one uh, time period, bring that about, but I'm saying there are ways that you can accelerate that. And the way to do that, I think, is to remove a lot of the negativity and skepticism and bring in positivity into your mind. And therefore, what that brings about is that frees up your imagination and your intuition. And this, these are just very important, in fact, critical. Albert Einstein, he always said that it wasn't intelligence that brought about his greatest discoveries. It was imagination and intuition. These were the things that true genius was all about. So I would say that what we want to do is we want to be able to have that positivity, get away from all of the negativity that this whole world seems to have been enthralled in for countless eons. And we want to experience a much better life, a much better reality. And when we start being more positive, that's what can happen. Because you do believe that anything is possible. I'll give you a little example just from uh, what might be construed as a, a real life example for the story. The actor Leonardo DiCaprio. He always wanted to be a great actor. And so what he did was he started thinking, I am Robert De Niro. And he just kept on thinking that and thinking that when he was younger. And then of course, what happened is he got a role in a sitcom. And from there, he started getting some parts in movies. And before he, too long, I think he got one of the greatest parts of all time and one of the biggest movies of all time, if not the biggest, Titanic. And I'm sure everybody knows who Leonardo DiCaprio is now. He's been in many major motion pictures. So it came true for him. And was it because he was anything special? I don't know. But what I can say is this, is that he had great belief that he could be Robert De Niro. And in fact, 
That's what happened with his life. And that is just a great example of what can happen when you do allow your brain to expand by thinking positively. So that's where I sort of want to go with this story. And I think the alien uh, influence is just sort of letting us know this is where these aliens are already. And they're trying to impart that to us. So that's why the story appears to be quite different. But in many ways, it's still right in the same vein of what I'm doing with the other stories, just building on it a lot further. Thought so. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite astute at times, everybody. Um, I want to now go to your last um, little um, story, your, your, win, your window of wonder story. Number eight, uh, The Seeker. The eighth window story. How did you come up with this storyline and the character Timothy? You know, and the, and the stones. Where did this come from? Again, it's slightly different to the first few books. And I'm just intrigued here. Mm, you've got me stunt on this one. Where did this one come from? It seems to have landed from nowhere, as far as I could see. <laughs> <laughs> well, in many ways, I guess it did. Um, when I was uh, beginning my adolescence, my brother, uh, he came home from college during Christmas, and he had this book um, by this Tibetan Lama. And anyway, along with it, he had this album and also this touchstone. And it was this very unusual stone. It was very, very smooth. And I thought, wow, this kind of has a calming effect when you start rubbing it. It's, you know, not like any other stone I've touched. Mm. And I always sort of kept that in mind. And um, from there, I developed sort of an interest in, you know, things uh, like the Tibetan Lamas and uh, these type of people, these mystics. And it was really funny. Um, this show came on and it was, uh, it was called Kung Fu. And there was a real oh, yeah. Kung Fu craze at this time, way, way back in the uh, early 70s. And uh, it wasn't the Kung Fu part, though, that really intrigued me. It was the, the fact that this, this, this guy it was played by a fellow by the name of David Carradine, a veteran actor from long ago. And he was a Shaolin priest. So anyway, he was sort of like a monk, you would, you would say. And he grew up in this very mystic tradition. So along with learning Kung Fu, he also learned how things like meditation and uh, a lot of mind discipline. So that really, really intrigued me. And I thought, wow, you know, that's who I want to be. I want to be Kwai Chang Kane. Because when I was an adolescent, I was going through a very difficult time. And I was very introverted and not doing well in school. And it just wasn't going well for me at all. And I was having a lot of problems being ostracized by kids at school. And it just seemed like everybody had turned against me. I had stopped playing sports at that point, which was the only thing that really saved me, I guess, before that. And so anyway, he just seemed like a so together individual, nothing phased him. And I thought, well, that would just be great. And I remember there was one episode where he was in prison and the, one of the Chinese mine workers was telling the sheriff, he said, don't you know you can't hold this man? A Shaolin priest can walk through walls. And I said, oh yes, that's who I wanna be. <laughs> and then so in many ways, while I couldn't join a Shaolin monastery, obviously, and go to China, I did learn to meditate eventually. So I did sort of become Kwai Chang Kane. And uh, that's sort of the beginning so of that story. that's where this story I comes have, from. Yes, we have our young scholar and he sort of uh, discovers this stone and it just takes him from there. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Because guess what, folks? You want to find out more about the story? Go and get the book. Um, <laughs> 
you know, like most of the podcasts that I do, Bob, you know, this is about giving people a flavor of what your book is about. It's not about giving them the total insight to everything because that would just spoil the plot, you know. Well, I know all the stories, so why should I go and buy it? Um, which brings me to the, uh, the point is, where can people go and get your book? Well, they can order it online through Author House. And uh, if they would prefer, of course, they can go to Amazon as well. It's in either ebook format, which of course is just tremendously inexpensive, so anybody can afford it. And you can also get it in hardback. And I would tell you this, I drew the cover for the hardback cover, I mean book, and it, uh, it's very compelling and it's really wonderful to have to be able to read, but it is more expensive, of course. So if you just want the stories, get the ebook. Anybody can afford them. They're that inexpensive. There you go, everyone. What's in the pipeline for Bob uh, Weatherly with regards to writing? Are there any books coming down the line? Well, yes. Um, I have uh, some, some health issues that I've been working through. So once I sort of, I guess, feel more energetic and back in the saddle, I fully intend on writing a couple of more uh, storybooks. Kids Very books similar, I guess. Uh, uh, these will be, well, you know, I know I do sort of gear these books for kids and adolescents, but I would say that much like Harry Potter, they can be read by adults and enjoyed by them, and they will benefit from them too. I mean, look at me. I'm 63 years old, and I want to be J.K. Rowling. So it's never too late. I would say you can be inspired and uplifted by these books no matter what age you are. But I do put a, a big emphasis on children because they are our future. And I just think any parent, they should be extremely excited to have their kids read this book. It's going to do wonders for them because, like I say, this is real magic. And it will have an effect on them. With all the damsels, the witches, the alchemist, the night. That's right. You'll get the read of a lifetime. I'll do it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, for me, this was an eclectic collection of stories, um, nicely written as well as beautifully told, everybody, but certainly with a unique edge to them. They are definitely. Uh, they've come from a different uh, point of view, a different style. Um, so when I first read them, I thought, hmm, these stories are very different. Did I love them? Oh, absolutely. I loved each one of the stories. But yeah, Sitting Brave, sorry, is still my favorite. Right, the Running Bird, probably with the, um, the Mystic Knight as a uh, close reserve follow-up. So, kids, that, you know, if, if you enjoy reading books and you love fairy tales, uh, mythology, folklore, um, you know, um, parents, you know, you read King Arthur on the round table, and this is the book, you know, that will suit you just as much. So I simply say, go and give uh, Bob Weatherly a read, enjoy his books, and see where he comes from with all his... Um, Quirky stories. I think quirky is um, the precise and correct word here because they are, they're quirky, they're original, they're unique with an intriguing point of view. So for me, I would just like to say to Bob, thank you very much for coming on the show and giving us a little insight into why the stories were created, how they came about, what they are about without giving too much away and where people can go and get them from. So thank like you, John. To you, Bob. Thank you for coming on the show. And thanks to all the viewers who watched today. Yes. Um, so as I end each podcast, everybody, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.